our next trainer is an expert in the brain and neuroscience. And one thing I love, how many of you, show of hands, have thought extensively about your brain? Anybody? Oh, wow. <laughs> Way more than I expected. It's usually the organ we think least about because we don't feel it. It's just there. And yet, it's the one doing the thinking. She's also world class at human performance. And she cares deeply about high-performing teams. Imagine what would happen if you could turn all of your team members into superheroes, into superhuman performers. How awesome would that be? Her company is called Human Accelerators. Everyone, please, please welcome, all the way from England, Jennifer Evans. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so we have a phrase back home that something might be extra. And that entrance and that video is what someone would call extra back in the UK. So I plan on continuing to be extra the whole way through uh, the presentation. There's quite a lot of information in here, so I will happily send you the slides if you're interested. So there's going to be a lot of information to uh, consume. There's also going to be some things in there that really get your subconscious mind thinking, testing some of that thinking. So do feel free to take notes, but I promise I will send the slides as well. So as Gio said, I own a business called Human Accelerators, and my mission here on Earth is to amplify human performance and consciousness. And today, I'm going to show you how you can do that in your own business as well. So I have created a program called The Science of Superhuman. I thought that would go down quite well with Gio and his audience. So that's currently under trademark now, so that we can start calling everyone here superhumans. And my business is focused on the most untapped resource that we have out there, and that's the human mind and consciousness. I don't know about everybody else, but at the moment, the amount of people that come up to me and start asking me whether I believe that AI is going to take over the world is pretty ridiculous. So the whole world seems to be focused on AI and technology. I believe we should be focused on the human mind and consciousness. Um, and that's really implementing 18 years of my work, both in corporate and now also in coaching and consulting. So, why do I do this? Well, the rate of change on the planet is the fastest it's ever been. So, in the last 100 years, humans have evolved exponentially. And so has our understanding of the brain. So, 30 years ago, we didn't even know that something called mirror neurons existed in a place called our prefrontal cortex. That's ex our executive brain. So, we had no idea how that worked. So, 30 years isn't that long ago for something that profound. And so the speed of new ideas and technology has accelerated, but that's because our brain has accelerated, not because technology just grew a life of its own and decided to amplify. So what do teams, what does that mean to teams? What that means is they have to produce more quicker, they have to adapt fast, they have to respond to change, and they have to be mentally agile. Now, that's not typically something that we're taught to do. So who is it that's upscaling our teams and performance if our education system doesn't teach us these things? And that's what I'm here to do. So for me, the most profound and important thing to tell you today is that companies are built and created by people. There are no companies without thinking, and you can't have thinking without communication to excel and to scale an organization. So a lot of my work is focused on thinking, communicating, and connecting. So thinking and communicating, why is that important? Well, people make profit in a company, and that profit grows the company so that it can thrive, but that doesn't happen without people thinking and communicating. That also requires life skills. So nothing in our current systems, both education or leadership, teach us how to think or how to communicate. 
which to me was a little bit crazy. So relationships, thinking, communicating, connecting with humans, we have to do that to survive. In fact, as a baby, we can't even live if somebody doesn't connect with us and touch us, but yet our whole system doesn't tell us how to do this effectively. Got me thinking. And we now better understand how the brain works. So we've evolved, as I said, at the quickest rate in history. Who's helping us keep up? Who's supporting your teams and you in keeping up with the speed of that technology, making people feel safe using it, rather than being scared that robots are going to take over the world? So our 20th century systems no longer work for the world that we live in. So we all know in this room, I mean, you're a well-educated room, I would call you, or we would call you in the UK, fairly woke. So extra and woke, you'll probably hear me use a lot. So we know that education and leadership programs are just not fit for purpose anymore. So how are we going to evolve? And this is where my story starts to come into play, and I'm going to tell you about my story and how this whole program evolved. So this system that we operate in, it keeps us unconscious. It doesn't help us become more conscious or connected with one another. And so I believe it's time to change that, and I'm going to help you do the same. Now, you're not going to be able to take in all of this information, but trust me, your subconscious mind is registering everything I say to you today. Your conscious mind might not be, but it will be in there. So I believe it's time to move from power over to power with. So how does the brain really work and why am I showing you this slide? So you'll see over here, there's a place called the neocortex in the brain. That's our knowledge center. There's a spot within that brain that recognizes every single person that you have ever met in your entire life, believe it or not. And there will be a memory and a trigger that's associated to that person. Now, our school system and our leadership development programs teach us that if you have a great knowledge center and you can regurgitate all of the information about all the disruptors in the 20th century, you're an A-grade student. Anyone else recognize that at school? A-grade student, if you can remember or sit a test and do really well on it. Well, that didn't work very well for me at school at all. I guess I was a bit of a disruptor. I was an entrepreneur from a very young age. So this got me thinking, why are we taught to work from the neocortex? And that's because it's very close to our emotional center. So our limbic brain is where cortisol is produced. And that's where we go into fight or flight. That's the hierarchical power over control mechanism that we needed when we were cavemen. But we've evolved so rapidly now that we don't need to utilize that brain as much. So we've developed different parts of the brain, like the executive center, so that we can mobilize without killing one another. So leadership and education systems haven't moved, though. So I find that really interesting. We've evolved as humans. Technology's evolved but yet the system hasn't that educates us. So a lot of my work, you'll hear me talking about the executive brain or the prefrontal cortex. And what that's doing is it's moving us from down here near the amygdala and the primitive brain where we produce cortisol, the I, it's all about me, it's about survival, to the we, which is the oxytocin-producing part of the brain, the executive brain. And that's where the magic happens. That's the really, really cool stuff. That's where we have mirror neurons. We can see the world through each other's lenses. We can connect. We can innovate. We appreciate, expand, we share. Everything that's good happens in the executive brain unless we have a lion chasing us and we need the cortisol to get away from it, which doesn't really happen so much in the world today. So I wanted to put that up there for you so that you understand. We don't just have one brain. We have different parts of the brain that enable us to mobilize and to connect and to think um, and innovate, to be honest with you. That's where that happens in the executive brain. So why am I telling you this? Everybody has a set of values, subconscious values. Now, you're going to hear me use the word double click a couple of times throughout this. I strongly suggest it's something that you use in your business. If you go onto your computer, anything you want to access requires a double click. You want to get into a folder, you double click it. You open a document, you double click it. You want your email, you double click it. Yet with communication, nobody double clicks. And so if our view of the world and how we interpret things is completely different to one another, why are we not double clicking on what people mean or what their perception of something is? So I'm about to double click on values. Values, my, the, the values that I'm referring to sit in the subconscious mind. 
And whether you know it or not, you're going to be driven to fulfill those values 95% of the time that you're in operation. And so a lot of you will have tasks or things that you are always putting off. You know that you should do it, you would do it if you had time, you could do it. But these are not your highest values. So your brain says, let's just avoid it and shut them out. So for me, when I say values, I'm talking about the system that runs your brain without you even knowing, without you even knowing, and drives you towards people, opportunities, and activities that are going to fulfill you. So that's not social idealisms. Your, your values are as unique as a fingerprint. So things like integrity and kindness and generosity, they're wonderful things, but they're social idealisms. They're not your core values. And until you know your core values, you can't operate out of the prefrontal cortex, the executive brain. So that one slight shift in everything you do in life and your business, truly working to your highest values, moves you to the executive center, produces oxytocin in the brain. So it's something that I strongly recommend that you sit down and have a think about. Pull all the layers back from what everybody told you through life and really think what it is that's on your highest values. And they typically come from a lack of or a void of things in childhood. So I call it SOSH, <laughs> Science of Superhumans, evolved out of my life's external work, but also the really deep inner work. And it's been an interesting journey that I'll share with you. So the system, just picking back up on this very quickly. The state-controlled school movement was created by the General Education Board and the Rockefellers and other financial elites basically moulded society. There was one award-winning teacher, John Gatto, who said from the first part of the 20th century, school looked upon, was looked upon as a branch of industry and a tool of governance. And I still think that that is around today. So we look at why we've evolved so quickly, but the system hasn't. And for me, I started going really deep into this research. In the UK, the, um, the number one killer of men under 45 is now suicide. And that got me thinking, well, why is that? And I believe that's because, and I know from research, is that we have now genetically changed. We actually activate DNA through transcription genes. So we turn on and off genes through language, believe it or not, even when we're in the womb. So if we're doing that and we're highly evolved and we're evolving the children and ourselves within this world, how then are we plugging them into a system that doesn't show them how to connect? Now, we have a tribal brain, and that tribal brain has to be fulfilled. If we don't connect with one another and with others, then the rate of suicide goes up, and that's what's happening in the UK. So I'm just going to play you a short video, because when I, when I watched this video, it resonated so deeply with me and my story. I'm quite intrigued to see whether it resonates with you, or maybe some of you have got children, and this is going to perfectly describe why you have such a challenge on your hands at the moment. There's a new type of children being born on Earth. Since sometime in the 80s, new children started appearing with different or unusual traits. Their numbers began to increase, and today, nearly 100% of all children born in North America are indigo children. So what are these traits? Let's go over a list developed by Jan Yordi, a play therapist who has been studying and working with indigo children for about four years now. As we go over the list, see if any of these sound like you. Maybe strong-willed, independent thinkers who prefer to do their own thing rather than comply with authority figures or parents have a wisdom and level of awareness and caring beyond their youthful experience. Traditional parenting and discipline strategies don't appear effective with these children. If you try and force an issue, a power struggle is the typical outcome. Energetically, indigos are vibrating at a much higher frequency, so they can get scrambled by negative energy easier. Emotionally, they can be very reactive and may have problems with anxieties, depression, or temper ages. Okay, the video's cut off, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. I was definitely an indigo child, and I was plugged into a system that really didn't work for me. And what that meant was I was just regarded as disruptive, so the creative brain in schools really didn't work. Now, the reason for that happening, I won't go into too deeply, but it's because our DNA is changing, because we've had to evolve as humans. So does anyone else in this room believe that they are either an indigo child or they have a child that is an indigo child? Wow, okay, so that's pretty big numbers. I know Geo's children are definitely indigo children because we talk about that. I have a four-year-old as well that's definitely an indigo child. So I started to go pretty deep into what was happening in our system around this so that I could create a program that helped people like you and also my clients in corporate. 
So I developed my values out of a lack of and uh, a deficit, I guess, something that was a void for me as a child. There were certain things that happened from the age of five on. I would pick up energy in a room. People were doing tests on me at such a young age for emotional intelligence. It was coming out at 99%. Nobody could understand why, because I wasn't an academic, but I could read energy, I could read people, I would know what was going to happen throughout my career in certain projects or businesses. And so... I got to the point where I went through a pretty big awakening in my 30s, was told that I was going to struggle to have children, realized I'd built a whole life based upon other people's social idealisms. Bentley was on the drive, living in million-pound mansions, had a partner that was an entrepreneur. I had the perfect life. I woke up one day to be told, actually, I hadn't got the perfect life because everything I was seeking was outside of me, not inside of me. And some pretty deep work had to be done because, funnily enough, the first day of my fertility window, I got married because the social idealism was you need to be married to have a child. So got married within eight months. And on the first day of my fertility window, which was three days after I got married, I fell pregnant. Safe to say, a year later, I was divorced. However, we do have a wonderful child and a good friendship now. And that was a pretty good awakening of other people's social idealisms being projected onto me. Now, I swallowed that because my dad died when I was 17 very suddenly. I'd left home at 16, hadn't seen him. And all of a sudden, I had to become this person that had this huge company, lots of employees, fast cars, big houses. But actually, what I really needed to do was do the inner work and then discover who I really was to be my authentic self. So I have an indigo child, and I wasn't prepared to plug him into the system because the system royally effed me up. And so Science of Superhuman was born. So my career, let me give you a bit of a background first of all. So I've worked in corporate companies. I'm an entrepreneur. I've had a consultancy for 18 years. I work with clients, contractors, consultants. They basically built the most complex, highly regulated, billions of pounds worth of projects. So nuclear, rail, anything high-tech engineering like de defense. So I picked the most difficult industry to go into to prove a point to certain people like parents. And so I've built teams who have delivered trillion dollars of projects in the most complex environments. So you have, let's call it, a government in Nigeria the contractors in America, the consultant would be in the UK, um, and you just had an absolute mess of human interaction and communication trying to deliver something highly regulated and complex. So I really started to learn about human behavior, really started to look at where things were breaking down. And I got to a point after working with FTSE businesses and Fortune companies where the same things kept happening. So this career that I had that fulfilled me now started to make me feel pretty rubbish because I was moving families all over the world to deliver these mega projects. And I would know intuitively within two to three months that these projects were going to nosedive. And so it just didn't sit with me any longer. I had to change career. So I went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> and that rabbit hole leads me here today. But it started with a tool co called Herman. So Ned Herman used to be the talent development director of GE. 97% of the Fortune 100 companies use this tool. And it started getting me realizing that cognitive diversity and thinking preference in the, in, in the brain were really fundamental. So from the age of 7 to 25, we develop preferences in the brain like we would left and right hands. And so that means that we have blind spots. But nobody teaches us that we have blind spots or to develop into those blind spots or even hire people into those blind spots because we have a pattern-seeking machine as a brain. So if we see someone that we like and we connect with, we want to hire them. We don't think about the fact that they're good in the areas that we're not necessarily because they're going to challenge us. So this takes real inner work because the education system doesn't tell it. And then what happened was I started studying with somebody called Judith Glazer. She was a mentor of mine. She coached the board of NASA. She took DKNY from 250 million to 3 billion in 18 months and Burberry from 900 million to 12 billion just by implementing one of the modules that I'm going to take you through now. Then about five years ago, Google actually released a study called Project Aristotle. Has anyone heard of Project Aristotle? Wonderful. So... Essentially, they looked at peak performance in teams, high-performing teams, and they wanted to find out what the number one thing was out of 180 teams over five years of research. 
And believe it or not, the number one thing conducive with high performance in businesses is psychological safety. So that got me thinking, well, if we've got a system that doesn't make us feel safe being who we are, and then we're teaching leaders to follow this process of do what everybody else does or just do what I tell you, how are we creating psychological safety for anybody? And so the work really started to begin. And then I studied under uh, John Martini as well, the human behavioral specialist. So I took that research and I thought, well, what makes people that I believe to be legends different? And so I went on a mission. I went on a mission hunting out the people that I thought were the number one performance person in the world, which was Tony Robbins, number one entrepreneur, Richard Branson. That's me at Ulu Saba, actually. So um, I know uh, that was mentioned earlier, but I was very lucky to be part of a mastermind that went on safari with him and spent about 11 hours with him, which was absolutely epic. Then Steve Wozniak for me, I was really into engineering. Apple was the biggest company, so I sought after him, interviewed him. And then Kevin Harrington was the founder of um, infomercials and so has sold over five billion pounds in sales. So I really wanted to test these theories and I really wanted to understand what made these people different. And what I came to, so my research and what my program proved was that human potential, performance, and consciousness, which is something we never talk about, is dependent on understanding a number of things. Neuroscience, neurochemistry, and the environment we live in, as well as an aspect of quantum mechanics. Now, none of those things are nurtured unless we're in a culture of safety. We can know it, but we don't live and breathe it unless we have psychological safety in self and psychological safety in the environment. The mind has two parts. The subconscious mind is the original brain, and it can process 40 million bits of data from the environment every second. The mind is very powerful and very fast, but it's totally habitual. It's not creative. It can only play back what it learns. In evolution, the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex gives rise to consciousness. It's a small piece of the brain that is consciousness. Self or consciousness is an add-on option, and most people don't exercise the option. But note, it, has, it can process only about 40 bits of data per second. The subconscious mind is one million times more powerful. While the subconscious mind is fast, the conscious mind is slow at processing. That's why when you're in an emergency or stress, you operate from this one because it can operate fast and handle lots of data. But the difference between the two is this is habitual. It is the conscious mind that is creative and can generate free will. The conscious mind can control anything in your entire body. They used to say there were parts of our body that were involuntary control. But now we know that's, that's not true. For example, yogis can regulate their heartbeat, their blood pressure, or body temperature with conscious mind. So while the conscious mind can only handle a few things, the subconscious mind can do many, many thousands of tasks at the same time. Now recently, neuroscientists are talking about how your unconscious really shapes your life, your decisions. What they say, according to cognitive neuroscientists, we are conscious of only about 5% of our cognitive activity. Most people, 1% of their day is in the conscious mind. So every day, you, you create only from your creation mind, your conscious mind, only about 1% of what is going on in your life. And therefore, 95 to 99% of your life comes from your programming in your subconscious mind. Now, I'm pretty sure all of you actually know that information. You, you intuitively, you've been told it, so it sits there. But if anyone has really started to think about how that affects their day-to-day -day behavior, communication, how they recruit people, how they interact with people, 
it starts to get really, really interesting. And so I decided that we needed to create a program that took us through the steps of how to have a subconscious mind shift. And so those superhuman steps are on the screen. Number one starts with self. You are not a leader until your team classify you as being a leader. And I don't think personally you can lead until you know self. If you don't know why you see the world the way that you see the world or how you take on information or what your own value system is in your subconscious mind, how do you even know how to appreciate somebody else that works for you and how to get the best from them? So I set about creating a program to do that. Accelerating team performance. So I have 15 years as a headhunter working in some of the most complex environments. So I had a process of recruiting people based upon values. If any, do, who has a team in the room? Okay. And who's looking to scale that team as part of this? Okay. The fundamental thing that I, I realized was if we want to attract the right people for the roles in business, first of all, get really, really clear on why the role is there. So how does it interact with you? Why are you even recruiting that person? Because a lot of people recruit for the sake of it because they believe they need an operations director because hierarchical structures have an operations director in them. Not necessarily the case. The other thing you need to do is write the job description based upon how you perceive somebody's values would need to be to, to operate in that role. So as an operations director, what values do I think somebody would need to have to really enjoy that role? And then there are other things that you can do, like writing your job description in the thinking preferences of the person that's going to be coming into your team. And then you can start to interview them very innovatively rather than looking at just competencies and how long somebody's been in the job. Because that's what every one of my clients would do. Get me a new CEO, the last one's failed. Okay, why has he failed? Because he's rubbish. Interested. Okay, what have you done to try and rectify that? Nothing, he's rubbish. I hired him as a CEO. He should know how to do the job. Okay, and this kept happening and happening, but actually they didn't really know why they wanted a CEO. They didn't really understand what values that was bringing to the business or what the business's values were to align to it. So get super, super, super clear on why that person's there and what type of thinker and what type of values you think that person needs to have. And then I started to look into the neurochemistry of conversations. So to be able to co-create and get people to connect within a team, we have to understand how to use neurochemistry. How do we move people from producing cortisol when they're challenged to producing oxytocin and engaging that executive brain? And there's certain strategies that we can implement to do that. And the last one was conscious cultures. So those four things will completely transform your organization. If you have psychological safety in your business, so people are not in fear of retribution, if they raise something or challenge something or are not happy with something, you start to see results skyrocket. The Google research, if you are interested in it, Project Aristotle was pretty profound, and it was the first time anybody had ever found research like this. So what does that mean? That means focus on you first. So positional power to personal power, the I inside of the we. So looking at what your true values, your highest values are. What are the things that you do without any motivation? Motivation in speech bubbles there, because it can only happen intrinsically. People cannot be motivated externally. If you're in your highest values, you do not need to be motivated. You will do the things that you need to do. So get rid of everything that you don't need to do and hire somebody that really, really wants to do it. Thinking preferences, reprogramming your subconscious mind. That was probably one of the biggest things for me. Looking at where there were emotional triggers, where I had a judgment or a lens on something. Now, the brain works very similar to quantum mechanics. Everything is in equilibrium in this universe. As soon as you have an emotional charge or a memory that's charged in your brain, the brain is not in equilibrium. You have to go back and rewire that subconscious thinking to be able to do that and see people and the world through a very different lens. And psychological safety. So you intuitively know, your brain knows if you're out of balance and it will either send messages to you, you'll have internal dialogue with yourself or people and um, opportunities or circumstances will be sent to you to take you back into equilibrium. That's the way that this stuff works. So nothing is by chance. You can't be your authentic self without psychological safety. So you have to do the work on you. If you want to scale performance and leadership, it starts with you. So I created a part of a program that takes people through the steps in that. 
This is the whole brain method that I referred to earlier. So there are four different thinking preferences in the brain. Now, is anyone looking at that model and straight away recognizing where they think they sit? Because that happened with me immediately. I looked at the right brain and thought, oh, wow. That's why everything left brain in my business gets left. And it's exactly why I connect with people when I'm recruiting them who are right brained. And so this is why operations and process and systems and data every time in my business would be nose diving, but put me in front of a client. Let me get into their mind and utilize their team that have all of these systems in place. That's when I was in my sweet spot. So sales and marketing, anyone who's using sales and marketing to grow their business, which I assume, just show me your hands if you use funnels, sales, marketing, data, okay. You need to be writing not only your business's strategic intent to your internal team, but also all of your external marketing needs to be considered around these four areas of the brain. Because different thinkers buy, sell, and communicate differently. So if you're only talking to your company in left brain language of, why are we doing this from a data perspective? What's the process of making more money? And you're not talking about the bigger picture and innovation and people and emotional connection. 50% of your team are disengaged and I guarantee you they're turning up to work for a paycheck and then they forget about work when they go home. A simple shift in communication Whole brain communication means even if individuals don't understand part of the message, they can connect and resonate with why you are there as a business and what their role does within the organization as part of the mission and the vision of the company. Now, that gets super powerful when you want to start using funnels and marketing messages and advertising or even website content because every single leader I've ever come across uses their own thinking preference to communicate what the business does and why it's there. So up to 75% of people at any one time are left behind because they just don't get it because they don't think like you. So it's super important. And then th this is also maybe something you would have heard about recently, but Mihai was the godfather of flow psychology. Flow psychology is a state of consciousness. It's an altered state of conscious consciousness, sorry, which gives us radical impact on mental and physical performance. And when I say radical, I'm talking McKinsey did a study that showed that executives have X5, so 500% more performance and productivity in one day than any of their peers when they are in flow. So they only need to work one day a week compared to the rest of their team to super exceed the performance of the rest of them. So flow is something that you should be looking at in your business. If there's bottlenecks, if there's breakdown in communications, if you've got naysayers, if you're not communicating with your team in a way that encourages flow, you are going to get eaten by the competition, without doubt. So if flow's not in the data, in the DNA of the organization, I strongly recommend that that's something that you do when you leave here. And flow is actually measurable and universal. So this isn't just for me and my clients because they were corporate and delivering billions of projects. It's universal. Every single person has the ability to move into flow if there are right precedences that are reached to do that. So it amplifies creativity between 400 to 700%. There is no innovation without creativity. You're not innovating, you're dying. You will get eaten by your competition. Learning capacity increases by 470% in flow. And Harvard says that flow not only trains the brain to be creative in the now, it trains the brain to be created over time. Because the more the brain does something and feels good, has those happy hormones, there's five chemical hormones that are uh, chemicals that are released when you're in flow, and it's the only time in our lives when all five are released together. So flow is pretty addictive for your team once you get them in it. And so I'm thinking 500% increase in productivity in a day is definitely lo worth looking at in terms of your organizational structure and how you're coaching your teams to communicate. So building a team, what's most fundamental for you today? Designing your organization for flow. 
Hierarchical structures are so antiquated and old school now. Don't look at what everybody else is doing. Look at who you need to connect within your, within your business. Look at the functions that need to have flow operating through them so that you can get this increase in every single employee. Can you imagine what it would be like to have every single person that works for you X5, 500% increase in productivity. And if flow is in the DNA of the organization, that's what happens. So cognitive diversity, different thinkers, make sure you're looking at thinking preferences, your thinking preferences, get real with yourself, be honest about the things that you just avoid doing and let somebody else do them. And innovative interviewing, I've touched on that with you. Interview people against the thinking preferences needed in the role. Write the job description in the thinking preferences or the value system that you want in the team. And then also create a team strategy for psychological safety. And I'll brush over this quickly. It's in the slides so that you can take them away. But everybody thinks that communication is like one source of communication. There isn't. There's multiple, there's seven in particular that I use, ways of communicating with people. There's co-creating, humanizing, aspiring, navigating, generating, expressing, and synchronizing. We all have reality gaps. We do. The brain has to move. It's a push and pull energy. We have to move in and out of conversations to be able to process. If you're dropping out when I'm communicating something really fundamental, I can't be sure that you know what I'm expecting of you. So how can I measure you against it if I'm not considering these things? So not all conversations are the same. Nine out of 10 conversations actually hit, miss the mark. Make sure you're double clicking. That's where double clicking comes in. Just ask that people understand, create the psychological safety for them to say no. And this is the dashboard. So I want you to try and picture this in your mind. Having resistors in your organization is a good thing. It's really good. Some of the best resistors or the strongest resistors in companies I have worked for have been the people that have ended up being high performers. They know something's fundamentally not right and it's not working. And they're not always just trying to be disruptive. So embrace your resistors. Talk to them. Create safety. Ask them what it would take to get from being a resistor to being a skeptic. You know, don't try and jump from resistor to co-creator, the I to the we. Take them through the dashboard. How are you feeling? What would make you move from a resistor to a wait and see? And I always recommend asking questions for which you have no answers. The brain's a slippery thing, and a lot of us will ask people questions that we already know the answer to because we're trying to influence people to go down the same journey that we want to go down. So you create psychological safety by asking people questions that you don't have an answer to, and it shifts the brain chemistry. You have to be present. You have to operate out of the prefrontal cortex if you're not already in judgment knowing the answers. So I to we. And creating a conscious culture. As I said, there's four different steps here that I want you to go away and imprint into your subconscious mind. Culture of safety. Everybody's talking about risk, technology, AI, and all of the rest of the things that robots can do. But if we can't even explain human consciousness and where memory sits in the brain, how are we going to program a robot to do it? It doesn't make sense. Utilize the assets that you've got in your business because your biggest assets are your people. And if you create a culture of safety, they'll naturally take risks and innovate because they're not in fear of retribution and being punished or ridiculed if they're not right or if it fails. The next thing is a value structure. Now, you stress is a really interesting topic. Stress isn't always bad. If you're living in your highest values and you're challenging yourself, you create something called you stress. Now, that's a good thing. A different chemical reaction happens in the brain. It increases performance. And actually, quick decision-making and actions are what get you in flow and keep you in flow. So if you have you stress, it's a positive thing. Distress is where you're operating outside of your highest values, where you're doing the work that isn't aligned to who you really are, when you're doing the work that your brain's telling you, I really should do this, but I just can't be bothered, or I just don't have time, that's not living in your highest values. That's when we get cortisol in the brain. That's when your teams are going to start getting sick. And if people are in a constant state of distress, that's when we start to get things like cancer and various other diseases that are created in the brain. So you stress, good stress, distress, not good stress. 
and highest values living in your prefrontal cortex, that executive brain where all the good sexy stuff happens, that's where you want to be living. And the other is communication. As I said, language is a really tricky thing. It's our biggest drawback. But language is used to release chemicals in the brain so that we know whether we trust someone, whether we know how to avoid somebody or how to connect with somebody. So I know these are the things that you're not taught in school, and it sounds really basic. But this, I have seen shift teams from really underperforming and looking at you know, sabotaging one another to multi-billion dollar organizations that are now thriving. And as I said, Google have released a study called Project Aristotle, which proves that psychological safety is the number one thing for performance. So if you want to amplify performance and consciousness, those four steps are what I want you to take away today. So today, I'm supposed to be speaking to you about scaling performance and leadership. That's how we do it. The I inside of the we, your thinking preferences, your blind spots. It's going to take a little bit of honesty, a little bit of inner work, you know, stopping the subconscious mind telling you that this is just rubbish. It's going to take you sitting down and doing that work on yourself. So we're going to move you from the lower mind, where cortisol is produced, to the higher mind, where oxytocin is produced. Self-transformation doesn't work unless you are operating out of the executive brain. If you're in your primitive brain, if you're constantly producing cortisol and you're in fight or flight, you are not connecting with your team at all. And so scaling performance and leadership from power with, using neurochemistry, prime the environment. So double clicking is great, but prime in the environment. If you're having a meeting, who, put your hand up here if your boss or somebody in your team has ever said to you, we need to have a chat, and you get that wave of like heat, and then it's cortisol, and oh God, what do they want? Put your hands up for me if anyone's ever had that. Okay, most of the room. Prime the environment. If you're gonna have a meeting with your team, set an agenda that says, this is why I wanna talk to you, this is what I want you to bring to the meeting, and this is what I want you to have a think about. We are gonna talk about some challenging things, but we're looking for solutions, so just come, be honest, tell me what's happening, and we work together as a team. That would be prime in the environment, and it's so easy to do, but so many leaders overlook these small things that make huge differences in a business. So double-clicking, prime in the environment, huge things. Then you need to recruit superhumans, okay, with superpowers. <laughs> and Doing that means a good organization design. Don't just draw out a top-heavy hierarchical organizational design because somebody told you to, or you've worked with consultants that have done it before. Look at where you need flow in your organization. Look at where you need to be available for people to be in flow, because I promise you the results in terms of statistics aren't lying. If you can create flow in yourself and with your teams, you are going to see your businesses skyrocket. Recruiting and retaining superhumans. Retaining people is not going to become a problem for you if you recruit a team that live in their highest values. They don't need external motivation to do their job if their job is in their highest values and they have psychological safety because the tribal brain is activated. So you then become family. People don't want to leave for money. People don't leave organizations for money. I've done this for 18 years at the highest level. It's never money that makes somebody leave. It's just a byproduct of why they're unhappy. And conscious culture. So psychological safety, leading with brain values. So being honest with people around what your values are. Telling people, hey, do you know why I actually give you this piece of work? I could do it. I could do it. I'm human. We can learn to do anything we want to learn to do. However, it's not in my values. I respect that it's in your values, but I'm probably not going to do it the same way as you. So if I'm asking you questions, it's not because I don't think you can do it. It's because I can't, and therefore I want to learn. I want to understand why you're a peak performer in that area. And building into the culture in every aspect and function. So some people hear the word flow. I think, oh, we'll do that in the finance team because they're left brain thinkers. So if we do that in finance, they're going to find a way to save loads of money, we'll increase profit, everyone's happy. Well, no, you and about 25% of your company on average are happy, not the whole organization. So look at flow in every interaction and every function in your business. 
And I always say, ROI for me doesn't mean return on investment. ROI for me is return on intelligence. If you hire people in their values, if you put them in the right role, if you create psychological safety, every single area of your business is going to be in flow. You then get return on intelligence from every single person in flow. So that's 500% per day increase in productivity. Learning ability goes up to 470%. And then you have a team of people that are happy to challenge one another, and challenge and support equals growth. There is always equilibrium. You cannot grow without both of those things. And so psychological safety and building that into every area of your function is the way to go in your organization to create superhumans, who then collectively can access super intelligence. Now, the really interesting thing here that I'm going to leave you with to have a thought over, to take you from where you are today through a transformational journey of waking up, essentially, and being able to build the business of your dreams means I have to engage your prefrontal cortex. When I get you and your team into flow, the opposite happens. We actually wipe the prefrontal cortex out which is really, really interesting because if we have an increase in performance and learning about ability and productivity when we're in flow, but yet we're not using the prefrontal cortex, where are we connecting to? Because it's way, way, way beyond our intellectual capability. And that's how you create super intelligence and superhumans. So if you would like to join me on this movement, that's what it feels like to me. I feel like I've given birth to this program, having lived it. If you'd like to join me on this movement and become an evolutionary leader, I'd love to talk to you. My email address is at the bottom, and just email me saying, I am in, and Gio and I will talk about how we can connect with you and turn you into superhumans and connect your teams to superintelligence. Thank you.